um, this is a bit of a late later stream because um, I'm pre-recording this for uh, Thursday so you can post it on YouTube and such so um, yeah because I'm not gonna be available on Thursday so I thought why not just uh, pre-record this before, uh, beforehand so you know we do, wouldn't miss anything so anyway um, we're gonna be covering recurrent neural networks today so um, in the last two lessons we've covered basic neural networks and uh, you know yeah just uh, how how neural networks work the bait like how yeah the concept behind how neural networks work what perceptrons are yeah, you know, what hidden layers are what deep learning means and stuff like that and we covered how to implement you know a basic uh, neural network with yeah so um now we're going to be talking about a different type of network this one is called a recurrent neural network so we're just going to be uh moving on here uh you can see that right okay good so um a recurrent neural network so a recurrent neural network or an rnn is a type of neural network that uses sequential learning where a series of processed inputs are retained while processing the next series of inputs so that means that uh every previous inf uh, input is still retained to an extent so even uh, a value, a neuron from a few layers before can still have an impact on, you know, the current neuron that's being processed. So it's more of a sequential type of learning. Yeah, that, and it works best with sequences, obviously. So um, the pros of this type of uh, network is um, it's very effective when analyzing various types of sequences and predicting their next values. Um, there's many examples of this off the top of my head. A really cool example is music generation. That's been really advancing in recent years and I think that's a really good example of what RNNs can be capable of if used correctly. Um, the size of the model does not increase with the number of inputs like it does with a standard neural network. So that means that the model will be more efficient with uh, larger and larger data sets, so uh, with more and more values. And with, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's just always good to have. That's You always want efficiency in your models. That's always a goal to strive for. And um, weights are shared in time, so weights yeah, weights are shared between the perceptrons, yeah. So um, some cons of this algorithm is that it has difficulty access accessing information from a long time ago due to the vanishing gradient problem. So um, yeah, it has difficulty accessing the inputs that the hidden layers from, yeah, the initial, like hidden layers from many layers ago. Uh, how do you, I think I said, uh, I'm not really, saying this correctly but you, you get what I mean you, because there's various hidden layers and whenever the layers are going a bit further back it's a bit hard for the algorithm to access that information because of variation vanishing grading problem we'll go over that a bit and um, the algorithm cannot also access future inputs to determine its current state so it can only access past inputs that are behind it in the uh, neural network. So yeah, so this is the vanishing gradient problem where um, when using backpropagation, so backpropagation is an algorithm so uh, essentially what it does is uh, yeah, so it calculates the uh, gradient of the error with respect to the neural network's weights. So um, what happens with the vanishing gradient problem is that whenever uh, the gradients become smaller and smaller between, uh, no, sorry. Whenever you have a small value for an error gradient, for example, the value that you're gonna get through back, back propagation is going to become increasingly smaller and smaller until it reaches a point where it's almost infinitesimal, like it's almost infinitesimally small, and um, 
at that point, that's the point where the learning stops because uh, there is no error gradient, so there's no change, right? So, um, yeah, and so when the error, the, the gradient is so small that learning stops. So, um, yeah, that's basically the vanishing gradient problem. And uh, let's start, um, yeah, let's start going into how we're going to be using RNNs. Um, so, first thing we're going to be doing is import TensorFlow as TF. Um, yeah, so all of this can be found on um, all of this can be found on the GitHub, uh, GitLab, sorry. Import sequential. So that's going to be the model we're going to be using from tensorflow.curas.layers. Import dense. Dropout. Uh, and I'll go over all of these uh, specifically, but this is uh, essentially this is the model that we're going to be using. Um, this is the type of layer. This is the standard type of layer for neural networks, pretty much. Dropout is a method to prevent outliers and exceptions. Uh, to prevent, how do you say this? Um, to create more accurate and more efficient results from a neural network. So how this works is essentially deleting, um, how, yeah, I'm not really sure how dropout layers work. It's a bit, it's a bit strange, but, um, yeah, um, well, either way, it creates more, um, accurate uh, results in the end and um, yeah it creates more accurate and more efficient results in the end and LSTM is the type of layer we're going to be using for RNNs so it's a yeah this is yeah that's going to be a recurrent type where it's going to loop through um, the neuron yeah so um from sklearn.metrics import classification report. There we go. Yeah, we're gonna be needing that towards the end. But anyway, um runtime warning, Yeah, well we don't need to worry about that. So the first thing we can do is um, import our data set. So Kira Kiris dot data sets dot Fashion. And just. Um, so as you can see, I think if you were paying attention in the last lecture, we did use another dataset called MNIST, but uh, this one is a bit different. It's called uh, Fashion MNIST, as you can see. And um, while the other M, I don't think it's called MNIST, M N I S T, however you're supposed to say it. Um, the other one was a uh, data set full of uh, 28 by 28 pictures of uh, just hand people handwriting numbers. Uh, it's, that's what the data set, yeah, that's the contents of the data set, and it had 10 classes total. Now, this one is a bit different because it has, um, instead of numbers, uh, handwritten numbers, it has articles of clothing. So, um, is that article? Wait, pieces of clothing. Can you say articles of clothing? Oh, I guess you can. No. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. So you had articles of clothing. It had yeah pieces of clothing instead of the handwritten numbers. And there's ten types of pieces where you can differentiate from. So um, now that we've loaded the data set, uh, we get. Do it with the X train, X no, Y train, because thankfully TensorFlow has already done this. Or TensorFlow, yeah, you know, yeah. 
it's already been done. All this stuff has already been done for us. So all we need to do is do this. And that's it. So let's see the head of our data. Oh, whoops. Let's do the X train head. Huh. Well, okay. No, that's sorry. That's the let's look at the first value in X train. So as you can see, these are these are the values for the pixels in the um in the what do you call it? <laughs> In the image, sorry, yeah. And since it's on a grayscale, it's just gonna go from zero to 255. But uh, we could just check real quick. So we could say dot max. I think it's without parentheses here. Nope, it is with parentheses. My bad. So dot max 255. There we go. So um, the maximum value here is gonna be 255. So um, probably talked about this before but neural networks are the most efficient when the values are smaller so ideally you would want to have all your values between 0 and 1 when you're uh, using them as inputs in neural network so um let's do that so x train is equal to x train divided by 255 for now y train is equal to y train divided by 255.0 and um, later on, we're going to be training these in real time. So uh, once we do that, I think you'll recognize why it's so important to do this. Because by itself, this is going to take a pretty, well, not a pretty long time. It's going to take a minute or two to train. But if we didn't do this, it would take much, 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 much longer. Trust me. So um, yeah, now that we have that done, um, yeah, um, so now we can work on creating our model. So we can say model is equal to sequential, sequential, there we go. Model is equal to sequential. That's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the basic model for our neural network. And then we're just gonna add layers to this. So the first layer we're gonna add is going to be our LSTM layer. Um, we could say 256 neuron um, input uh, shape oh my goodness is going to be uh, 28 by uh, 28 uh, we can see that here if you want to um, I'll just add a new here a new thing here so X train at uh, oops zero dot shape that's 28 by 28 so yeah um, yeah, so the shape of the values we're going to be inputting into this is going to be 20 by 28. And um, the activation function is going to be relu, or, God, uh, what is it? Yeah, the rectified linear. There we go. Oh my goodness. It's a bit late, but that's probably why I'm forgetting everything. But yeah, rectified linear. Um, that's a function we, an activation function we talked about in our initial neural networks lesson, and this is a pretty common one, in fact a very common one, and a pretty efficient one as well. And it's a pretty simple one to understand, so you know, all around it's a good one to start with. Um, finally, we can set return sequences to true. All right, now that we have that done, all right. Um, we can add our second LSTM layer here. So we can say, we can put it at 128, and then we can put the activation for Relu here. And um, we don't need to put the input shape for the following layers anymore. Um, and we don't need to specify the return sequences either. So um, that's good. Now we can, oh, I'll just copy paste this for the next ones. Um, I'll say, okay, so now we have to go back to the standard neural network. We have to convert that back. Um, so yeah, 120, and then we're still using the activation function for relu. And then finally for our output, yeah, so this is gonna be our last uh, layer. 
we have 10 classes as outputs. Um, I can show you right here. So, um, huh? Wait, no, no, no. Is it Y train? Uh, am I looking at the? Hmm. Oh no, no, never mind about that. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, there's 10 classes essentially that you can choose from between the clothing uh, types of clothing there. So um, that's why we have the number 10 here. And we're switching this to um, softmax because this is going to be the final layer. Yeah, Rahi covered why we need to do that in the uh, last lecture. So you can check that. Um, so now that we've done that, we can say model.compile. And then we can uh, specify that what type of loss function we're going to be using. And uh, like Rahi said before, a categorical cross yeah cross entropy is the most common type of loss function. I'm pretty sure you're not going to be. Oh my god, I have to type it all out. What a pain. Okay, categorical. Nope, not a lot of fun. Yeah. So yeah, so Rahi covered that. This is the most common type of loss function and probably the only one you're going to be needing to use for a while. Um, the optimizer we're going to be using is Atom, which is once again a very common, I should put that in quotes, but yeah, once again a very common optimizer to be using. Um, so nothing special to see here. Yeah. Uh, Uh, let me see. Hmm. And then the metrics. Actually, wait. Yeah, we can see that here. Let me see. Um. So you can look at all the things we're gonna be looking at here. So all all of our um parameters here. So for the loss function, we could see that um. Yeah. The objective function or loss function incidence and this is a quick rundown of what uh, um, yeah basically what uh, yeah what a loss function is you can read that if you want to just press shift tab if you're using Jupyter notebook I'm not really sure if you can do that with uh, well I mean I'm not sure which other ID you'll be you'll be using aside from Jupyter notebooks uh, so I'm not yeah, other than Jupyter Notebook, I'm not really sure. But um, you can always go look up the uh, documentation if you want to really read this stuff and you don't use Jupyter Notebook. So uh, there's that as well. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, the metrics we're going to be using is uh, accuracy. Because, yeah, that's where we're going to be measuring by. Uh, that, whoops. Why did I do that? There we go. Huh, missed the equal sign for some reason. Yeah, so um, there we have our metrics. Now, this is going to be the easy part. You would think that going in. Oh, so epics is, um, yeah. The. So we're going to set epics to three, and the validation data, the yeah, the validation data, the data we're going to be using to validate our results is just going to be x test and y test. Oh, it would take a bit of a while, and it is. Um. So once that is done, we can see our accuracy. We're going to be seeing our accuracy for that. Um. So let's see. Uh, our yeah our classification report for how accurate our result our results were yeah one minute left we got this Yeah, our accuracy is about 0 
or so. Which is not bad. I mean, with a bit of tweaking in how many layers we have and how many neurons each layer has and such, and uh, which types of layers we have, we could probably get it to be a pretty, a lot higher, honestly. But um, this is good for now. Um, this is good enough to demonstrate how RNNs really work. And uh, yeah, we could, we could tweak it later, but this is good. Five, four, three, two, one. There we go. Boom. Ray. So, now that that's done, is it done? Please say it's done. Ah, uh, oh, yay, we did it. Okay. Prediction is equal to model dot predict x test. So, we're going to use this model that we've got with this um, after these grueling minutes of uh, <laughs> of training yep there we go now we will use the classification report that we got from up here and then we'll print that so classification report and then we will use y test and prediction so we'll see how we did what did I do wrong? Multi class and continuous multi output targets. Huh. Interesting. Hmm. Well, uh. Let's just see how the value. Oh, whoops. Y test. Let's see, uh. Yeah, so if you uh, round each of these, you know, for example, I mean, look at this. Uh, you've got 8.98, .8, which corresponds to 9. We're, there's there's a better way to do this, but we're just going to like, just for the sake of comparison real quick. Yeah, 8.98 .8 corresponds to 9. So this, yeah, we have a pretty good accuracy here, as you can see. So yeah, there we go. That's it. Those are our RNNs. So that's the lesson. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for watching.